I want you to open your Bibles to Daniel channel 3. <laughs> Chapter 3 of Daniel. Verse number 13. The 13th verse of the third chapter of Daniel, I read. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. Made well, But if ye wor worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fire furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and boy, I like this statement, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. And here is one of the great verses in the Bible. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. They said, Your Majesty, it just may be that our God's going to deliver us. But if our God doesn't deliver us, doesn't make any difference, we're not going to bow down and worship that thing. We're not going to do it. I want to talk tonight on the subject, God is still on his throne. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> what a responsibility this is. After all these great men of God have been here, it's awfully easy to develop an inferiority complex anyway, just, just realizing you're on the program with all these great men. And yet to carry the responsibility upon frail human shoulders such as mine for the closing hour is more than I'm able to do, especially by myself. And so, Holy Spirit, I cast myself upon you. I pray you'd speak through me and to me. I want to be a blessing. Now, if I could be a blessing and preach a great sermon, I'd like that. But if I have to choose between the two, help me to be a blessing. If I could be a blessing and have a clear mind and an eloquent speech, I'd like that. But if I have to choose between those, help me to be a blessing. Do something real tonight. Dear God, I didn't know that night when I preached on what is man that thou art mindful of him in 1961 to a small crowd in the Antioch Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't know that the future editor of the Sword of the Lord was sitting out there. And who knows, the future editor of the Sword of the Lord may be sitting here tonight or the next Billy Sunday or the next John Rice. I pray tonight You'd reach down and give me one. Oh, God, give me one tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Not only was Dr. Hudson's sermon a blessing, an inspirational, and motivational, but it was therapeutic. If a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, there's not a sick person in this room now after that delightful, refreshing sermon we heard a while ago. I'd like to take you tonight down a little different trail because I feel maybe we ought to have this thought sometime during the conference. I wish I could tell you young preachers that everything's going to be all right in your future ministry. I wish I could tell you that, <coughs> that you'll <coughs> never have to know the inside of a, the cell of a jail I wish I could tell you that the government's going to give you freedom to operate and you'll have a great mountaintop ministry. It may be true, but I don't know if that's true. But this one thing I do know, 
I know that whatever happens in the future, if we feel the cold coldness of the dagger, the steel blade of the sword, or the dampness of a 20th century Mamertine prison, this one thing I do know, God is still on his throne. Amen. Now, I'm a little concerned uh, about, about a philosophy or an attitude that our fundamental people have whereby we equate prosperity as we count prosperity with God's blessings and adversity as we count adversity not with God's blessings. A young man came to me and <laughs> had come to Hiles Anderson College and he said, Dr. Hiles, um, I guess God must not be in it. We've had nothing but trouble ever since we got here. I guess God must not be in it. He said, the Bible said, my God will supply all your needs. And I said, but sir, one of your needs is trouble. And if God supplies all of your needs, God will have to supply trouble. In just a few weeks, the Hiles Anderson students and students all across America will go to colleges like ours. And in just a few weeks after they arrive, they will start their cowardly retreat homeward. All over America, Limelex and the Omis are leaving for Moab because of unemployment in Bethlehem. John Marks are turning back. Demases are forsaking the will of God. Lots are going to Sodom to follow the well-watered plains, and Jacobs are fleeing to Haran. And Abrahams are headed for Egypt and blaming the will of God for their lack of faith. I want to serve notice to you tonight that if things do not turn out according to your own appraisal of what's good, that does not mean God is not in it. God is in it whether it turns out to meet your appraisal of good or bad or not. One of the most carnal things we do is to equate the will of God with whether or not it turns out as we think it's best. One of the most tragic things is if the church is going well, then God is in it. If the church is not going well, then God is not in it, and I feel led to leave and go to a, another field. If we're well, God is in it. If we're sick, God is not in it. If we're full, God is in it. If we're hungry, God is not in it. If we're employed, God is in it. If we're unemployed, God is not in it. If we have ease in life, God is in it. If we don't have ease in life, God is not in it. If it turns out like we think it should, God is still on his throne. And if we think it turns out as we think it should not turn out, it is as if as God were not on his throne. Then when things take a turn for the better, we put our little God back upon his throne again and rejoice that once again God is on his throne. A Hiles Anderson College student said to me not long ago, said, Preacher, I got a job today. God is still on his throne. And I said, son, God was on his throne when you didn't have a job. God was on his throne when Paul was placed in the dampness and darkness of the Mamertine prison. God was on his throne when the apostle Paul rotted there in near blindness in the dungeon of that Roman prison. God was on his throne when the apostle Paul was led to the guillotine and the sharpness and coldness of the guillotine sword severed his head from his body. God was on his throne when John the Baptist baptized Jesus and the, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and a voice came out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But God was also on his throne when John the Baptist was beheaded. You know, things don't have to turn out like you and I think they ought to turn out for God to still be on his throne. And things don't have to turn out like you and I ought to think, think they ought to turn out for us to stay at our churches. You got the idea nowadays, if you're hungry, let's turn back. God is not in it. God was still on his throne when John was exiled to Patmos. John, God was still on his throne when David Livingston put his wife to rest. He had gone out in the jungles of Africa. He'd left his wife back home. Some terrible scandals were spread about David Livingston, and he sent and, uh, and got his wife and brought his wife. And then soon she was taken in, in, uh, in uh, terminal death 
a terminal illness and died. And when David Livingston laid his wife's body in the soil, God was still on his throne. God was still on his throne when, uh, when my, my daddy, um, my daddy stepped over my body when I was begging him to stay with mother and me and left us never to live in our house again. God was on his throne when my mother the next morning went house to house begging for a quarter so she could buy her boy something to eat. Let me tell you something. God doesn't have to satisfy your appraisal of good or bad to still be on his throne. God was on his throne when, uh, when my mother and dad had their first child, a little girl named Laureen. She never turned over in bed for seven years. She never walked. She never talked. She laid there. She never said mommy. She never said daddy for seven years, afflicted and uh, paralyzed almost all of her body. And at the age of seven, she died. And as my mother and dad went out to the little cemetery and laid Laureen's little seven-year-old body beneath the Texas sod, God was still on his throne. God was on his throne when, when uh, another little baby was born and uh, named Hazel to my mother. And my mother reared Hazel to be a lovely, healthy little seven-year-old girl. She got the measles when she was seven years of age. And uh, my mother was holding her in her arms. And Hazel looked up at mother and said, Mother, I feel like I'm going up in the air to be with Jesus. And she did go up to be with Jesus and died in my mother's arms. I served notice on you when my mother held that little body in her arms that once she had carried neath her bosom and once she had fed with her bosom. When my mother held that little baby in her arms, God was still on his throne. And I want to serve notice tonight. You preachers having difficulty, God is on his throne. And you folks who have illness, God is on his throne. And what you and I think is bad, God may think is good. And what you and I think is good, God may think is bad. And we have too many Christians fleeing the will of God on the basis of no job or some job or no food or some food or, uh, or unemployment or having it tough. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, as sure as God be God, we need as much as we need sunshine we need shadow. And as much as we need noon times, we need midnights. And as much as we need the good, we need the bad. I was down in, in uh, Tampa, Florida, preaching Dr. Brother Rudolf and I years ago together under a big tent. And after the service was over, Brother Rudolph had preached and I'd followed him. I was in the tent by myself. The tent seated about 2,000 people. Nobody was there but me. I thought I was alone looked up and saw an old man, stoop-shouldered and hair as white as the winter snow, walking down the aisle, the aisle of the uh, sawdust aisle of the tent. He said, Dr. Hiles, could I talk to you for a while? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, better still, could I pray with you? And I said, why, sure. So we knelt here at the altar, this old man. He said, could I lead in prayer first? <laughs> and I said, go ahead. <laughs> Nobody, never the two of us. The old man began to pray. Here's what he said. He said, Dear Lord, I hate bacon powder. Now, I'd never learned that prayer in college. And uh, I looked up and I thought the guy had gone crazy. He said, I hate bacon powder. I hate bacon powder. And I, I listened to him and he said, Dear Lord, I hate flour. I hate flour. Dear Lord, I hate shortening. I hate shortening. He said, Dear Lord, I hate salt. I hate salt. At that time, I was just watching him pray and uh, wondering what was going to come next. And uh, <laughs> then he listed a whole bunch of stuff like that. Then the smile of heaven came on his face and he said, But Lord, put them all together and stir them up and cook them in the oven. And I sure do like hot biscuits. And I said to myself, that's the best exegesis of Romans 8, 28 I ever heard in my life. Let me tell you something. God doesn't have to satisfy what you think is prosperity to still be on his throne. God was on his throne. When, I, when my dad fell off a sawhorse in Irving, Texas years ago and died the death of a lost sinner unless he repented between the time he fell and the time he hit the floor. God was on his throne when I stood over my daddy's grave and heard them as they dropped 
the thudding of dirt upon the casket that contained the body of my dad. God was on his throne when John Bunyan stayed for 12 years in the, uh, in the Bedford jail and rotted with the rats. God was on his throne when his little, little daughter, blind daughter, precious little girl, there's a book about this, came to him and said, Daddy, I've got some good news for you, Daddy. I've got some good news for you. And John Bunyan said, what is it, honey? She said, Daddy, they say you can come home to be with Mommy and me. Here's that good news, Daddy. And John Bunyan said, yes, sweetheart, it is. She said, Daddy, all you've got to do is promise you won't preach on the streets anymore and you can come home with Mama and me. You will, won't you, Daddy? You will, won't you, Daddy? And John Bunyan looked at her and said, sweetheart, if they let me out of jail today, I'll preach on the streets tomorrow. And while John Bunyan rotted in the Bedford jail, and he served notice, God was still on his throne. God was on his throne. When Ann, Madden Iron Judson, left for Burma, after they had their first little baby, that little baby soon was taken ill and was laid beneath Burmese soil. And when they walked away with broken hearts and an empty crib, God was still on his throne. And then when a second child came, and that child was taken, and that, that little child turned to Burmese dust, God was still on his throne. And then soon Anne was taken from the arms of Adoniram. When Adoniram Judson walked away from his first little baby and second little baby, and Anne Judson, God was still on his throne. God was on his throne when I stood where I stand right now, and the body of his dear friend desire I had in my life, Dr. John Rice, body rested right beneath this pulpit where I stand now. 2,200 times across this nation, Dr. Rice and I sat on the same platform and shared the pulpit together. And, uh, and when we looked at his face, I just somehow didn't equate death with John Rice. But as I walked by and looked at his face, let me tell you something, Dr. Rice may be gone, but God was still on his throne. God was on his throne when this dear pastor and wife in this church, when this little lady over here heard she had multiple sclerosis and spends her life in a wheelchair, bless God, he's still on his throne, and God is still good. God, God doesn't have to satisfy us to be good. God's God, and God's good, and God's on his throne. Job or no job, food or no food, health or no health, good or no good, bad or no bad, God is still on his throne. Just a few weeks ago, the word came to me that this dear precious pastor's wife, not only with multiple cirrhosis, but now with cancer. And I heard about it, and I called and, and spoke a few words to the pastor. I mean, not one word of complaint. Said, Brother Hiles, we're discouraged, but we're not defeated. We haven't lost our faith. Let me tell you something. With multiple cirrhosis and cancer, doesn't matter. God is still on his throne. God was still on his throne. When Bill and Kathy Rice heard that little Betty was going to be deaf, high fever gripped her little body, and uh, something happened and caused the doctors to say she'd never hear. And they spent all the money they could find, had money they could find, doctor after doctor. And finally the word came that little Betty would never hear again. God was still on his throne. God was still on his throne when Peter was crucified upside down. God was still on his throne when Dr. Lee Robertson heard while he was in a meeting his little daughter Joy had died suddenly. And Dr. Robertson drove back home after that meeting. I say God was on his throne. Oh, we equate the throne of God and the blessings of God with sunshine. But the dearest and sweetest blessings I've ever known in my life have come in shadow time and night time and midnight time. And I'm a little tired of fundamentalists tucking their tails under their spiritual backs and taking off. I'll leave the church because we're having a tough time. God must not be in it. The deacons are causing me some trouble. God must not be in it. We're having a tough time. God must not be in it. The attendance is down. Let me tell you something. Whether the attendance is down, up, deacons like you, don't like you, things are on top or on bottom, has nothing to do with whether God's in it or not. God was on his throne. And Harold Seitler's little nine-year-old daughter started to cross a highway years ago in Greenville, South Carolina. A drunken driver came a weaving his way down the highway, left his lane, went over and hit this little nine-year-old girl 
and she was taken on to heaven at the age of nine, God was still on his throne. God was on his throne. When Mrs. Monroe Parker, Dr. Parker's first wife, was killed one night in a car wreck by a drunken driver, God was on his throne when the plane went down carrying my good friend Lester Rola. I do not know two greater Christians who've ever walked the sands of this country than John Rice and Lester Ola. They're gone, and I miss them, but I serve notice. I bear God is still living, and the Holy Spirit is still powerful, and this book is still true, and God is still on his throne. God is on his, was on his throne when in the fullness of time Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. God was on his throne when our Lord was rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, despised and rejected of men. God was on his throne when Pilate at Pilate's hall took the cat of nine tails and laid it across the lovely back of our Lord. Thirty-nine times that nine whip handle had lashed across the back of our Lord till Isaiah said you could not even tell that his body was that of a human being. And when Jesus, our Savior, dipped his own soul into hell and God the Father turned his back on his Son, God was still on his throne. God was still on his throne. When 406 people walked out of First Baptist Church Hammond in 1960, 23 years ago this month, God was still on his throne. And whether I stay or whether I leave had nothing to do with adversity. Well, I'm so tired of students coming in and saying, I guess you better go home. God, God doesn't provide. I guess I made a mistake. No, you didn't make a mistake, you yellow-bellied coward. You stay where you are. God's alive. God is good and God is this I to the starve to death in the will of God than leave, live in plenty outside the will of God. Amen. I tell our Hiles Anderson College students, if you've got to turn off your electricity, get your kerosene lamp, but you stay in the will of God. Amen. If you've got to turn off your heat and get your wood stove, you stay in the will of God. If you've got to eat one meal a day, you stay in the will of God. God was on his throne. When for three long years at First Baptist Church of Hammond, we couldn't get going. God was on his throne when they tried to burn our house down one night. The next night, my little five-year-old son, David, said, Dad, would you come and sleep with me? And I went and sat in a chair beside David's bed and stayed up all week long, every night, all night long for seven nights. And then I heard a little voice in the other room say, Daddy, could I come in too? Our seven-year-old daughter, Becky, came and, and lay down in the bed beside David and little Linda who was only two, almost three. She said, Daddy, can I come in there too? And she came in for seven nights. I stayed up all night so my children could sleep because they're afraid, afraid of being burned to death or killed by the enemy. Let me tell you something. While some of you rascals are copying the First Baptist Church of Hammond with its baptisms and its conversions and its Sunday school, let me tell you something. You don't have life till you've had death. You don't have a resurrection till you've had a burial. You don't have joy till you have tears. And as long as you equate adversity with God not being in it, you will never know the blessings and joy of Almighty God. God is on his throne when you face the wall. God was on his throne when Christians huddled in the Colosseum and the lions were turned loose and they sang and praised God and their lives were taken and their spirits placed in the presence of Christ. God was on his throne and the pilgrims on that first winter had somebody in each home to die and the Mayflower went back the next spring and they were all given a chance to go back to, 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 to Europe or to England and every one of them said, we'll stay with the grave still warm of their own loved ones who had died during the winter time. God was still on his throne. Hey, don't you put God on trial. Don't you put God on trial. God doesn't owe you anything, and God doesn't have to make it turn out like you think it ought to turn out. You stay where you are. Listen, if God led you where you are, you haven't got to check anymore about where you ought to be. You don't have to open up the will of God every day. 
If one time God led you where you are, then you stay. And don't you consider leaving. And don't you ask God if you're supposed to leave. When you unpack your suitcase, you say, God, do you know my address? You know my phone number? Now, I'm not going to check with you about where I ought to be till you call me. You want a crown with no cross. You want a victory with no battle. You want a resurrection with no death. You want a cure with no illness. You want a rainbow with no storm. You want deliverance with no bondage. You want an empty tomb with no Calvary. You want a quenching with no thirsting. You want the promised land with no wilderness. You want your, your waves calm with no storm. You want a sunrise with no darkness. You want a revelation with no Patmos. You want a solution with no problems. You want a perseverance with no hardships. You want an upper room with no Gethsemane. And so every time things go well, every time things go well, you put your little God back on his throne. No job. God's not on his throne. Hey, I got a job. God's on his throne. But I got to work night. God's not on his throne. Get off your throne. <laughs> but I get a good salary, so God's on his throne. But I got to work on Saturdays, so God's not on his throne. But I feel real good, but so God's on his throne. But the wife is sick, so God's not on his throne. But my mother-in-law's sick too, so God's back on his throne. But it's 101 degrees, so God's not on his throne. But I got an air-conditioned car, so God's back on his throne. But the price of gas is too high, so God's not on his throne. But I drive a little car, get 35 miles a gallon, God's on his throne. But the road's bumpy on the way to work, and God's not on his throne. But they're going to fix it. I lost my glasses, so God's not on his throne. But I got him back, so God's back on his throne. I went to a sword conference, and God's on his throne, but I got to go home, and God's off his throne. But I bought the tape, so God's on his throne. But they cost me $100, so God's not on his throne. But the check was hot anyhow, so God's back on his throne. But they sent me a bill, so God's not on his throne. But I got Dr. Hudson said uh, autograph, God's on his throne. But Robertson got away, God's not on his throne. <laughs> Let me tell you something, brother. God is always on his throne. God's on his throne at sunshine, and God's on his throne in the clouds. God's on his throne at noontime, and God's on his throne at midnight. God's on his throne in the calm, and God's on his throne in the storm. God's on his throne when you're employed, and God's on his throne when you're not employed. God is always on his throne. And when God doesn't measure up to your standard of living, you even have the audacity to get bitter. I can't comprehend that. What? Bitter at him who gives you the air you breathe? What? <laughs> Bitter at him who gives you the food you eat? What? Bitter at him who gives you the loveliness of the Rocky Mountains like pyramids covered with whipped cream? What? Be bitter at him who raised the redwoods of California like the mighty Samson of the forest? What? Be bitter at him who painted the desert with his masterpiece what? Be bitter at him who raised the pines of Carolina like steeples above earthly sanctuaries. What? Be bitter at him who dropped his own teardrops 10,000 times on Minnesota and formed 10,000 lakes. What? Be bitter at him who gave his only begotten son. What? Be bitter at him who said goodbye to heaven's darling and let him come to earth for 33 homesick years. What? Be bitter at him who had no place to lay his head, though foxes had holes and birds had nests. 
the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. What? Be bitter at him who was expelled from his own synagogue, hated by his own people, and kicked out of his own city, crucified by his own world. What? Be bitter at him who went to Pilate's hall and suffered the agony of the cat of nine tails. What? Be bitter at him who went to up Golgotha carrying the cross on his beaten back. What? Be bitter at him who took that cross that was nailed to it with hand, nails in his hands and his feet. What? Be bitter at him whose precious body lay three days and three nights. What? Be bitter at him who was the king of kings but had no throne but a cross, had no crown but a crown of thorns, had no scepter but a borrowed walking stick, had no royal robe but a soldier's overcoat, had no subjects but a jeering mob saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! How dare you get bitter at him? I understand that. You better thank God that Paul had more than you got. Or he'd have said, I guess God's not in it. I got stoned. Now, deacons often get stoned, but deacons, but preachers, different kind of stoning. I guess God's not in it. You better thank God Paul didn't have what you got. Didn't resign every time the deacons looked at him through, through the forked tongue. The gospel never got into Europe. You never heard the story of Christ. You better thank God John Rice didn't say, Yes, God's not in it. I walked by that old man's room many a night. Just a little light was flickering in his room next door to me. I've gotten up and I've walked by his room night after night at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. And seen that old man on his knees begging God because he had burdens. I've seen him cry with tears that nobody else ever saw him cry because folks he, that they thought loved him had betrayed him. You better thank God. Dr. John Rice didn't say, I guess God's not in it. I guess I better go on home and postpone or cancel or call off the sword of the Lord. We wouldn't be having this conference today. You better thank God Dr. Bill didn't say, I guess God's not in it. Got a deaf daughter. Wouldn't be any Bill Rice Ranch tonight. You better thank God John Bunyan didn't say, I guess God's not in it. Wouldn't have any Pilgrim's Progress. You better thank God Lee Robertson didn't turn back because little Joy was taken in death. Wouldn't be any Tennessee Temple College. You better thank God the Pilgrims that had more than you got when they laid their loved ones to rest that first winter. I guess God's not in it. Nothing is turning out right. It's cold. We haven't got houses and our kids are dying and our wives are dying. I guess God's not in it. Yes, he is. Yes. But God said he'd supply all my needs. Yes, I know. And one of Paul's needs was a Mamertine prison. And one of John's needs was the Isle of Patmos. And one of David Livingston's needs was to lay his wife in, the, in African so so soil. You say, if the attendance is up, I'll hang in there and give it my best. If the attendance is down, I'll hang in there and give it my best. If I get promoted for doing right, I'll do it. But if I lose my job for doing right, I'll still do it. Boy, I like what those people said. They said, Your Highness, we're not going to bow down and worship that big image you made. Not going to do it. Now, we believe our God will deliver us, but if our God doesn't, we're not going to do it anyhow. We're not going to do it. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fight to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? No, I must fight if I would gain. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. If I find a job, I'll stay in college. If I don't find a job, I'll stay in college. If the family's well, I'll give my all to God. And his sickness stalks us all of our lives, I'll give my all to God. If I can clean up my convention, I'll, I'll serve God. If my convention votes me out, I'll serve God. <laughs> I don't know what the future holds. I do know this. I never thought when I began preaching 37 years ago, when I knew Lester Roloff, he and I were young preachers together. I recall the day that Dr. Lee Robertson came to preach in Texas. Brother Roloff and I both went to worship him. 
I can recall standing in line with Lester Roloff with our Bibles open like this, waiting for Lee Robertson to sign the fly leaves of our Bibles. Little did I know in those days that my good friend would spend his some time in jail. And I wish I could tell you tonight that we're not going to have some more of that and for it to get, it's going to get worse. I, I wish I, I don't know. But I know this, come what may, God is still on his throne. <laughs> it may be Cuba. It may be that preachers be lined up as they were in Cuba and killed for the crime of preaching the book. But God will still be on his throne. Amen. It may be like Latimer and Ridley. Or our churches may be padlocked. But it's about time that fundamentalists decided we're in here to stay. Amen. We're just here to stay. Amen. And we're not going to prop God up, push God down, prop God up, push God down, prop God up, push God down. God's there all the time, and God knows what we need. If God feels I need hunger, I'll take hunger and believe God's on his throne. Folks in Hammond know this is true, and I have not, I have not suffered for Jesus. But I was praying on Lake Michigan. Well, not on Lake Michigan, beside Lake Michigan. <laughs> I, I can only walk about 20 feet out there on the water. <laughs> so I, I, I don't usually do it. <laughs> I was praying beside Lake Michigan where I'd prayed for years, regular spot. Got in the car after a couple of hours of prayer and backed the car out, looked up the rearview mirror, and a fellow just lifting his rifle to shoot my head. And just about the time that he pulled the trigger, I, I swerved the car. The bullet went by the car. I used to jog about two or three miles every night before I went to bed. 11 o'clock one night, a few years ago, I was jogging the car full of people came by. They cursed me. They drove around the block and came by and began to shoot at my feet. That's where I learned to dance. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, my folks don't know this is true, and some of my folks here tonight, I don't think I've told this at home. Maybe I have, but don't think I have. A man came selling a fourth row from the front right here. One night, our service. He had a pistol loaded and cocked with his finger on the trigger. He had his coat off <coughs> covering that pistol and a $65,000 contract in his pocket all my life. His plans were to walk down the aisle that night to act like he's going to be converted when he get to the altar. <coughs> he's going to take his coat off like that and assassinate Dr. Jack Hiles. During the sermon, God got to move in. And the fellow did walk down the aisle took his coat off his pistol and handed it to me and said, I want to get saved. <laughs> hey, God is still on his throne. But if the next time the man comes and does not get saved, and if the trigger's pulled and my life is taken, God is still on his throne. And I... We'll be looking at him. I'm talking to folks who've turned back. I'm talking to folks who quit the bus ministry. I'm talking to folks who quit your bus route. <coughs> I'm talking to preachers who quit your bus ministry. Never understood why. When financial reversals come, first thing you stop is the biggest soul winning program or arm of the church. I've never understood that. Never understood it. One fellow said to me, Dr. Hiles, do you still have the buses now that the price of gasoline's gone up? I said, yes, sir, because we didn't start them because the price of gasoline's gone down. Amen. I'm talking to folks tonight who quit and turned back. I'm talking to preachers about to quit. Turn back. I'm talking to students that don't think you can go back to college. Go back. Go back. But you say, I just don't think God's in it. Well, I'll tell you, he may or may not be in it, but whether he's in it or not has not one whit to do with whether it turns out like you think it ought to turn out or not. God is still on his throne. It's time for God's people to stay with the Hebrew children of old. 
We're not going to do it. It's wrong. We're not going to do it. It's wrong. We're not going to support your cooperative program. It's wrong. This is a Hebrew. We're not going to send one red cent to Southern Seminary. It's wrong. It's wrong. We're not going to, we're not going to send one student to Southwestern. It's wrong. It's wrong. You say, I'm upset about that, and I'm not going to come back tomorrow night. I'm not either. It's wrong. Come hell. Come death. Come tribulation, come persecution, come hunger, come unemployment, come sadness, come sorrow, come illness, come multiple cirrhosis, come cancer. God is still on his throne. Our Heavenly Father, I pray somehow you'll give us the courage of the prophets of old. Help us to sing at midnight in the prison with Paul and Silas. Help us to learn to rejoice in persecution. Help us to write from the Mamertine prison, I've learned to be content whatsoever state I am. God, forgive us for being cowards. Forgive us for turning back. Forgive us for going back to Haran with Jacob, to Moab with Elimelech and Naomi. Forgive us because we haven't had the courage Say, God's good, whether I'm sick or well, whether I'm hungry or full, whether I have a job or I'm unemployed, whether my deacons love me or hate me, whether my church is going well or persecution is imminent. Oh, my God, tonight help us to say with those Hebrew children, come what may. We're not going to bow down and worship that image. Our God, we believe, will deliver us. But if he does not deliver us, we still are not going to do wrong. Our heads are bowed. And our eyes are closed. You know who you are who needed that sermon. You know who you are. You know what you quit. You know what you've stopped doing that you once did. You know that Sunday's class, school class you quit because since you took it, nothing's gone as you think right. You know who you are. You know who you are that quit that church because you did not think your things were going right and you equated the will of God with God satisfying your whims of what's right and what's prosperity. You know who you are. You know who you are that's turned back from college. You know who you are that's refused to go to college. Do you get enough money to pay your first year's tuition? You know who you are. And you know who you are that has been putting God up or down, off or on the throne, on the basis of how it equates with your idea of prosperity. And there are hundreds of people in this room tonight who need to decide that God is on his throne and that God does not have to do what I think and obey my blueprint for life. To still be God, to still be good, and still be on his throne. You know who you are. You know who you are. Turn back. Quit your Bible reading. Quit your praying. <coughs> quit your soul winning. Well, ever since I was a soul winner, things haven't turned out right. That doesn't mean right. You don't know what's right and wrong. God knows what's right and wrong. God knows what's good for you and bad for you. Brother, just keep on going. Come what may in the will of God, doing the will of God, being in the will of God, whether you think it's good or not, because you don't know whether it's good or not. I wonder how many would say, Brother Hiles, that was for me tonight. Oh, that was for me. I'm guilty of equating God being in it, or God's will, with my appraisal of good and bad. Preacher, God is working in my heart right now in a special way about some matter. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hand, please, all over the building? Come on, come on, come on, come on, upstairs and down. Come on, choir, downstairs, balcony. Come on, come on, come on. Keep your hands up. You may lower your hands. 
I wonder who else would say, Brother Hiles, I did not raise my hand then, but I should have. Include me when you pray. Brother Hiles, I, I stand guilty tonight. I stand condemned tonight. I'm equating God's goodness with my appraisal of goodness. I'm equating God's will with my idea of what's good. I did not raise my hand then, but I should have, and I do now. Pray for me. God's working deep in my heart tonight. Would you lift your hand? Who else, please?